Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Our last lesson spoke about Faraday's law and about how a change in magnetic flux could create a potential difference to create a current inside a loop. And we're still dealing with that today. We're going to take an alternate look. Previously, we looked mostly at a change in flux, meaning a change in the strength of the magnetic field as it went through a certain area. Okay. However, what we're looking at today in this case is slightly different. We have a moving conductor on rails which is completing a loop. Okay. And this rail over here is being slid over to the right which means that overall the area is increasing as the bar moves over to the right, which means that because there's an increase in area, that there's going to be an increase in the magnetic flux as well. So if we were to actually try to figure this out, as the flux is increasing, as the bar is moving over to the right, that means that the loop is going to try to counteract that strengthening flux. It's going to create its own flux in the opposite direction. So as the flux is increasing, the loop will try to work against it, which means that if I then use my hand rule for this loop now, right, if we have this loop, of course it's a square loop, but if it's going into the page, and as I grab my finger like this, meaning that I can see that overall the direction of the current is going to be clockwise. And within the bar itself, as the bar is sliding over, that means that there's a current being generated that goes down. Okay? So we're still solving for the direction of current just as we had done before, meaning that we have to first determine how the flux is changing. Then we will determine the direction of B by the loop. And then ultimately, we use the right hand rule, the first right hand rule, to determine current direction. Okay? But what's interesting to note is that this doesn't necessarily only apply to a bar on rails it applies to any situation that the bar could simply be moving through the magnetic field. Notice the direction of the charges as it's going through. <clears throat> Overall, because of the presence of the magnetic field, every time it passes through, it creates a current inside the wire. Even if that current isn't, um, doesn't seem to be connected to anything else. Now, over here, there's just a few more practice examples. So let's just do A together. Overall, the bar is being slid over to the right, which means that my area is decreasing, which means that my magnetic flux is decreasing. So as a result, the loop is going to try to strengthen it by creating its own field in the same direction. So if I use my hand rule, Okay, if I take a look at my loop, I can see my loop is coming out of the page, which means that my thumb at the bottom is pointing to the right, which means that overall the current is moving in a counterclockwise direction, or basically down through the bar. Okay? Mathematically, for any sort of wire that's passing through um, the field, the formula 
is really derived from the same one as before, EMF is equal to change in flux over time. But understand that because change in flux is really B times A over T, or the change in B, but area, in this case, because it's a square loop, will really be length times width. So it's B times length times width divided by T. But if I understand that width divided by T is really just a distance that's moving divided by time, then I end up with the actual formula being EMF of a moving rod is equal to B L V. Okay? So L is the length of the conductor. Okay? And the most important thing to remember about the length of the conductor is that it, it must be perpendicular to the direction of motion. And V, of course, is this velocity and also points which way it's going. So when you take a look at the problem below, over here, okay, we can see that this is the length of wire that's moving perpendicular to the velocity itself. So if I list out my given, I can solve for the EMF induced simply equal to B L V so it goes to zero point eight Tesla times one meter times one meter per second, which equals to zero point eight volts. If this resistor over here has a resistance of ninety ohms, then the current would simply equal to I is equal to the voltage divided by resistance. 0.8 volts divided by 90 ohms, which is equal to 0.0089 which is equal to 0 0.0089 amps. But what's the direction of the current? Well, in this case, we know that the area is increasing, so the flux is increasing which means that the loop will try to weaken the um, strengthening magnetic flux by creating its own magnetic field in the opposite direction, which means that overall, I can see using my hand rule, it's going to be in a clockwise direction. Okay, And of course, we could then take this further by using our previous form is to solve for power, electrical power, P equals to VI, or for work, P is e work is equal to V times I times T. I do want to point out the question below, which we're not going to solve right now, but when an airplane is actually flying through the Earth's magnetic field, there's a voltage generated from wingtip to wingtip because it's a moving conductor that's going um, perpendicular to a magnetic field. And we could solve for how much potential difference is actually being induced. But I actually want to come back to this question first. This question we had solved for previously in the last video by doing EMF is equal to change in flux, N times the change in flux over T. And we had solved it to be 1.5 volts. I just want to point out the new formula that we just learned, EMF is equal to BLV, would still work in this example over here. The length being the length of the wire itself and the velocity, which we could just solve for by solving for the distance is being pulled out, divided by the time that it took to pull it out, which is 0 0.1 seconds, okay? So if we were to take the extra work, I just want to prove that both formulas do work for the scenario, I would have to add an N because there are 100 loops in this case. So equal to 100 loops 
times the magnetic field of 0.6 teslas times the length of the wire that's being pulled, 0 0.05 meters, times the velocity, which is really 0 0.05 meters divided by 0.1 seconds, we would still end up with 1.5 volts. So either method is acceptable for this case, it just depends on the problem situation.